I'm Colleen Deli, host of the Inside the Vatican podcast. Welcome to Behind the Story. Pope Francis's book, Let Us Dream, is a wide-ranging interview that covers his thinking of how we should emerge from the COVID pandemic. Joining me today to discuss Let Us Dream is Austin Ivory, who collaborated with the Pope on this project. Welcome to Behind the Story, Austin. Hi, Colleen. Great to be with you. So, Austin, first question. You're not quite the author of this book or the editor. How would you describe how you put this book together with the Pope? What was your role? Yeah, it's actually been very complicated to sometimes to explain what my role has been. This is a book by Pope Francis, uh, and it's titled In Conversation With Me, but I never actually appear in the book. There is no question and answer. So it's a very unusual format. And the reason it's unusual is that it is the fruit of uh, many uh, conversations and exchanges that Pope Francis and I had over the summer during lockdown about the, uh, the, co- the COVID crisis. Um, but I wasn't ever able to go over to Rome and you know, sit with him. So it couldn't be ever really a kind of an interview. And more than that, also, it, it needed a kind of a depth and a space um, uh, that would be go beyond an interview and have a much stronger narrative. So we worked out, it wasn't well planned at the beginning, but we worked out this, this system really where, uh, you know, I would ask him questions. We, he would sometimes suggest articles. I would draft. He would then work on the draft. Uh, and so it, it was much more of a, coll- well, a collaboration is one way of putting it. But collaboration implies that it was a relationship of equals. It was really much more a master disciple relationship. But I suppose what I did for the book, uh, in the book, and my contribution to it was that I suppose I provided the arch- the, the kind of the, the the scaffolding, if you like, the architecture uh, on which the Pope could, or around which the Pope could organize his ideas and hang his thoughts. And, you know, as anybody who's ever uh, written knows, you know, the really laborious thing is, is the reworking of, uh, of, of the language, uh, the creation of a narrative. And I suppose it's all those sort of writer crafty things, which I was able to bring to this project, which he as a Pope, even though I think he's a brilliant natural writer, simply wouldn't have had time to do. So I think it works. It ultimately worked very well. Yeah, I mean, I thought it worked really well. Um, Let's talk about that architecture scaffolding that you brought up. The book is divided into three parts, right? It follows this structure that we hear about a lot in Latin American theology and Catholic social teaching, which is see, judge, act. It's a way of evaluating uh, your decision making, right? When when faced with uh, a, a social injustice, usually something like this, you see the problem, you ponder it, you discern, and then you choose how you want to act, and then you act. Um, and so that's that's also the structure that you use to approach this book with the Pope. Um, so let's let's start with the C section. Uh, and I, I want to talk to you specifically about this interesting uh, kind of more personal section that the Pope gets into, where he talks about his own personal COVIDs, right? He thinks that this pandemic, he's been saying this since since back in March, he's been saying that this pandemic is a time to to pause, it forces us to stop and to think. And so can you tell me about those times that the Pope talks about in the book where he was forced to do that? So his own personal COVIDs, as he calls them, as the result, I mean, by the way, there's the part of the book where I had to push him a little bit because he doesn't like talking about himself. But, right, you know, I was I said, surprised. I, I was like, I haven't seen this type of depth from him uh, Well, and, and, and I can tell you it required, it required a little bit of pressure and I felt a bit bad about it because he doesn't like talking <laughs> about himself. And he pushed back and he said, you know, I don't really know. I said, look, you know, you've talked about this in the Bible. You've talked about this. We need to know how has God acted in your life, in your own suffering? And, you know, he he got that point and and then gave me more and more, actually. So, in fact, what we have is the story of the three times in his life of intense uh, suffering, very different times. One when he nearly died age 21 on the operating table as a he had just entered a, the diocesan seminary. Uh, and it was the time, of course, when he had his part of his lung removed and he really did nearly die. I mean, the story is very dramatic. Um, and then another time is when he was sort of uprooted in Germany in 1986 after a, a, a period really of being provincial, being the dominant figure in the uh, Argentine uh, Jesuit province. So he's now in his 50s, ends up in Germany and you can see he's just completely deracinated, uprooted uh, uh, and in a kind of existential crisis. And then the third one, which is really the greatest of all, which people know about, if you know his story, there's this famous period, which is sometimes called the Cordoba exile. Uh, And it's it's 1990, 1992, when 
after a very difficult period in the province, which I uh, narrate in, in my biography, The Great Reformer, he ends up really without any kind of role. This is, and he's, he's well into his 50s now. Uh, as I say, he's been, he's been a leader really for most of his Jesuit life. The dominant now suddenly finds himself uh, completely ab ab abandoned in this Jesuit house, but with no role, no importance, no leadership. And you know he he described it very very movingly. I mean he has talked about it before, but I think this time he he described it very very movingly, uh, 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 and what it felt like to be as it, as he said you know sent off the the soccer pitch, the football pitch, and and put on the reserve bench. You know. You know you've written before a number of times, uh, especially in your last book in Wounded Shepherd about. Uh, the Pope as kind of a, a spiritual director, right? Leading the world's Jesuit spiritual director, leading the world through, you know, kind of the, the spiritual exercises. Um, and we see that again in this book, and you also actually use that term, the world's spiritual director. Um, and so I want to ask you about what Francis is trying to teach us about discernment, particularly in this second section where, you know, he's talking about how to how to discern, how to choose um, what are what are the basic takeaways there for somebody who might not be familiar with with Jesuit discernment? So when you go on an Ignatian retreat, you know, you do the spiritual exercises. The role of your spiritual director is extremely important because they're the they have the wisdom, the guide, and they guide you. But the real action takes place, as it were, between you and God, and it takes place in prayer. That, if you like, the agent of change is the Holy Spirit. Um, so discernment is all about saying, where is the good spirit working here? Where, where do we see God in this? Where are the movements of the spirit? And conversely, what do we see as the temptation that's undermining that? Right. And Austin, you know, it was interesting to see how this connected with the message of Fratelli Tutti, right? Because Fratelli Tutti, this recent encyclical by the Pope that was also very much informed by the COVID pandemic, um, in this book versus Fratelli Tutti, Francis actually, he speaks a lot more personally um, and goes into more depth about the social issues that he sees. You know, he talks about the Uyghurs, he talks about the George Floyd protests in the States, really in, in a depth that we haven't seen before, which I thought was interesting. But he sees it all as that's an integral part of, you know, this this seeing that then leads us to judging, that leads us to acting. So what he's seeing when when he looks at one of the interesting parts in, in part one is yeah, the George Floyd protests, uh, the Me Too movement, the reaction of the victims of clerical sex abuse who, who, who have been raising their voice, like Juan Carlos Cruz, who you just had on. Mm -hmm. um, these are signs of the people being moved to protest against the violation of their dignity. So there's two things happening. There is the powerful who are uh, using people and exploiting them uh, and failing to, to value and respect what is of God, uh, so human dignity. And at the same time, you've got this protest that's, if you like, about recovering that dignity. So here's a lights and shadow discernment. You know, where is God in that? Well, clearly God, the spirit is moving in those protests. But then, of course, he, Francis, is never going to be, you know, <laughs> led just down one path. He then talks about the, the pulling down of the statues, and which he really doesn't uh, uh, think is a good thing at all. He sees, if he doesn't say this, but he sees the, the dangers there, the temptations there of seeking to purify the past, cancel the past, rather than own the past and assume it. So there's... It, right, to so maybe phrase it in a more positive way, he's, he's, he, he highly values memory, right? And memory yes. as being integral to the story of a people and how they understand themselves. And that means seeing the uglier parts of one's history, too. And, and as it were, assuming them in all of their shame, you know, mm -hmm. to say, well, actually, this is who we are. We, we, we regret it, but we don't try and sort of, uh, you know, purify it. And, and that's important because um, in many ways, it's the loss of that memory, the loss of that consciousness of who we are as a people in our glory and in our shame that lies at the heart of our, our kind of our anguish and our deracination. I actually found that his most concrete advice came at the end, where I think the first sentence is like, what, what must I do now? Um, yeah. And he really takes it to a personal level. I was wondering if you could talk about that. What does he tell us to do now? Yeah. Yeah, we're giving away a lot of the book here, but, uh, <laughs> but no, I, I think I think um, I, I think that's the power of the epilogue. Actually, is is so the epilogue. So he, we've had part three, where uh, which ends on this very kind of powerful uh, statement of a vision 
for the regeneration, the redefinition of politics, economics, and society, a new way of living together, an economy that includes the poor, that provides work, that doesn't damage the planet. Uh, you know, we, we, we've had this very kind of lofty stuff. And then in the epilogue, he's saying, now, you know, now you, you know, and there's this invitation right. to all of us. And he says to, to move out of ourselves, to, to de-center, to transcend. And in a very simple way, he says, look, you know, go down to your local elderly care, go to your local refugee uh, hospitality center, your local eco ecological regeneration project. Yeah, knock on the door, say, what do you guys do? How can I, I have no idea what you guys, you know, how you guys do it, but maybe I could help. You know, put yourself out there, make yourself vulnerable, offer yourself, because this is about service. We discover the Holy Spirit, we rebuild a new future in making ourselves vulnerable and opening ourselves out in this way. So in a way, it's a very, you know, we've had at the end of the Sea Judge Act, uh, brilliant discernment of, of the world. We have actually a very simple invitation that none of us can, as it were, avoid or escape. You know, now me, now am I going to be part of this new future? Uh, that's right. Aston, thank you so much. I hope that we didn't give away too, too much of the book. Uh, but if our listeners, readers, uh, viewers want to check it out, it is uh, Let Us Dream by Pope Francis, published by Simon & Schuster, and it's out December 1st. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Peace. To hear our full interview with Austin Ivory on the Inside the Vatican podcast, just search Inside the Vatican on your favorite podcast app. And for more videos like this, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks so much for watching. For American Media, I'm Colleen Dully. We'll see you next time.